Your Royal Highness, Prime Minister, Excellencies, the unbelievable Unleashed talent here, thank you so much for having me. It is such an honor. Um, I'm going to get to the hard stuff. I come from India. A few months ago, um, there was a girl who got gang raped, and the police personnel asked her, well, which one did you enjoy the most? Um, in October, November of last year, I was dealing with a case of a young 24-year-old physiotherapist who was found raped and then set on fire in her own house. I had the parents, the bereaved parents, break down and tell me that the police personnel asked the parents, well, we found cigarette butts in your daughter's room. Does she smoke? As though that has any correlation to her being sexually abused and then set on fire. This month, we lost over 60 children in a hospital because the oxygen supply was cut off due to a dispute. We had the chief minister refuse to take responsibility and rather focus his resources on an upcoming festival. You know, leave no one behind is a calling slogan attached to the SDGs. But let's be honest, let's check our privilege. Every minute we are losing young lives to violence, to discrimination, to hate. And these issues are not just specific to India, you know, moving beyond just uh, gender-based violence, if you look at poverty, radicalization, displacement, these issues are not specific to just India. Today, we're facing a global crisis of failed leadership. We have heads of state who can't bring it upon themselves to come out and condemn and denounce racism, bigotry, and neo-Nazis, who pull out of the privacy... who pull out of the Paris Agreement and pretend like climate change does not exist. We have, we have heads of state who believe people belonging to the LGBTQI community don't exist in their country, and well, if they did, we will condemn you to death. So we have problems, we have colossal problems, but we also have a plan. The plan is the Sustainable Development Goals, a plan that thousands of you showed up for, um, a plan that we have to believe and rely on. The goals are based on the principles of interdependence, of interconnectivity, beyond just accounting for the most vulnerable and most marginalized. And I want to thank you, Your Royal Highness, for speaking and stressing on the importance of partnerships and equal opportunity and for your endless uh, advocacy for gender equality and bridging the generational gap. That was truly inspirational. So what do we do? How do we achieve this? Well, there are three points that I would like to address. One, resilience. If we have to achieve the sustainable development goals, we have to be resilient. And young people are intrinsically resilient, right? We put on our boxing gloves and show up for the good fight. You all have shown up here. So to address you all here, be impatient and be unapologetic when speaking up for your rights, when implementing the solutions to achieve the sustainable development goals. Show up and continue to show up. Second, leadership and accountability. You know, we have to treat the sustainable development goals as a social contract. Refer to the targets listed under each of the goals. Use it as a template to demand for accountability from your governments and establishments across all sectors. I'm going to leave you with a statistic here. Young parliamentarians in their 20s account for only 1.65 percentage of the total parliamentarians around the world, with the median age of parliamentarians being 53. Well, this is where we as a young people need to come together and demand for accountability and tell the government officials and politicians that if you expect us to show up for you and vote for you, well, then you better have to show up for us now. It's time for you to be accountable to us and speak up for our right. We need to hold our government officials accountable, our politicians accountable, and expect nothing less from them but to show up for us, to hold leadership positions, to run for office. The last one. The problems we're looking at are complex, but the solutions don't have to be. You know, I once met this amazing activist from America who was speaking to me about a case that had come up to her of domestic violence. Her husband 
was extremely abusive sexually, emotionally. She also had an emotionally abusive mother-in-law who every half an hour would ask her for tea, and she would do this. She would say, tea, 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 and she expected the daughter-in-law to get up, get out of her chair, go run to the kitchen and make tea. She wouldn't drink the cup of tea, it would get cold, her husband would, her son, -in -law, so her son would come home, forgive me, and she would tell him, look, look, look at your wife, she refuses to give me hot tea. Husband would beat her up again. This woman was so traumatized, and she came to this activist for help. The activist told her, okay, fine, I will help you, but let's start with one thing. The next time your mother-in-law asks you for tea, get up, make the cup of tea, but before you do, just take a minute and breathe. When she told me that that was a solution to the woman, I was shocked. It's like, that's what you told her to do? If I were you, I would tell her where she can put that cup of tea. And uh, she said, no, wait, let me continue. Um, so they ran this whole exercise of this cup of tea. She told her, take a breath. For this young survivor to even take a breath, it broke her. They ran an exercise. She pretended to be the crazy mother-in-law, for lack of a better word, and said, tea. Oh. I forgot to add an anecdote. After a point, the mother-in-law even stopped saying tea. All she did is this. And for the, dot, for the survivor to just sit down and take a breath, it broke her. It broke her. She would shudder. She would cry. And she couldn't sit down and just take a breath before she woke up, before she got up. So they practiced it and practiced it and practiced it. And they said, OK, fine. I think we have it. I think you can get up and take a breath soon. So she said, okay, go back home. First day, take one breath. Second day, take two breaths, and we'll report and touch base again. A week later, this young survivor comes back to the activist. She said, okay, what happened? The survivor says, I stopped making tea. And the activist was like, no, 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 what do you mean you stopped making tea? That was going to be like much later into the process. And the survivor says, well, first day I sat down, took a breath. Second day I sat down, took another breath. Now I just sit down and breathe. The woman is going to abuse me nonetheless. So my point is, you know, the problems we're dealing with are undoubtedly pervasive, insidious in nature, but our solutions don't have to be that complex. What is important, however, is for the solutions to be localized, is for the solutions to not just be cause-driven, but need-driven to serve the communities you are in, for the solutions to be sustainable. for the solutions to be sustainable, and most of all, for your solutions to have a gendered lens. I don't care if you're working on climate change, on sustainable consumption, on reduced inequalities. Your solutions need to have a gendered lens. And every single panel that I see up on stage, it's an eyesore when you only see men and men and men. So come on, let's have more female representation. So that's it, I have gone above my time, but all I will leave you with is keep those boxing gloves on, continue to fight the good fight, and don't apologize, and be restless and unapologetic when demanding for change. Thank you. Cool. Amazing. Amazing.